So when I really got interested and realized um, in my residency that I was interested in obstructive labor and neurogenital fistula, I went to Dr. Goldenberg and, and expressed that interest to him. And the first thing that we did was go and look at the maternal and newborn health registry, that registry of pregnant women from the global network sites. And when we were looking at this um, early segment of the global network data, we looked at obstructed labor, prolonged labor, and to failure to progress. Um, and we were really interested in outcomes associated with this uh, complication of labor. You can see that rates are relatively high in Pakistan and then somewhat consistent across the other sites. Um, I should just mention, I do have the chat up. So if anybody has any questions and, and they wanna ask while I'm going through, I can try to keep an eye on the chat and then otherwise we can talk at the end. So I didn't share the perinatal outcomes data with you, um, but we did look at that as well. Here, this chart shows maternal morbidity and mortality related to obstructed labor within the global network. Um, and you can see that uh, risks of maternal mortality, infection, and bleeding antenatally and postpartum are associated are, are increased in the setting of obstructive labor. So this is in the African setting and at the Asian sites, we can see an increased risk of adverse outcomes um, in the setting of obstructed labor. And again, increased risk here with a non-significant decrease in maternal mortality in our Latin American sites and then overall increased risk. So, um, Dr. Goldenberg at the time was collaborating with the Gates Foundation on this building of these mandate models. And what it was, it was a large Excel model that was built using data from the literature on prevalence of complications in pregnancy. And Gates really wanted to be able to use that model to decide what interventions were going to be most successful for various pregnancy complications and adverse outcomes. So since we were interested in obstructed labor, um, I, along with um, people from RTI, went ahead and built an Excel model for obstructed labor in Sub-Saharan Africa. And what we found was that um, without modern medical care, it was the model sort of suggested that, you know, close to 10,000 women would die from complications of obstructed labor uh, in sub-Saharan African setting. And then that number was reduced by the medical care that was available at the time. And so what we wanted to know was if we introduced different interventions, what kind of impact might that have on obstructed labor in the sub-Saharan African setting? So this first bar here shows if you improve diagnosis of dysfunctional labor. So often in low and middle income country settings, and, and here too, we use the partograph to sort of track women's labor and make sure that they're making appropriate progress. So we wanted to see, you know, if we improved diagnosis by increasing training with the partograph um, and availability of the partograph to low and middle income settings, how, what impact would that have on maternal mortality? And we see this drop would occur right here. If we're looking just at transfer, so the ability to transfer women from home and clinic settings to hospital settings, what impact would that have on maternal mortality from obstructive labor? And that accounts for this drop here. Now we see when we combine these first two within the model, um, we really see about a 50% drop in maternal mortality from obstructed labor. And then we move on here to some more interventions. So this is operative vaginal birth, which means forceps and vacuum delivery. And this is cesarean birth. So if everybody had access to operative vaginal delivery, who needed it? And if everybody had access to cesarean birth, who needed it? How much impact would it have? And you can see, interestingly, it really doesn't drop the maternal mortality that significantly. And it's not until we really get a combination of diagnosis, transfer, access to operative vaginal delivery, access to cesarean section that we're really seeing um, a drop to under a thousand deaths per year related to obstructed labor. Um, so I think the picture here is that it's really about, you know, the diagnosis and the transfer and the access to appropriate interventions to relieve the obstruction if you really want to have an impact. So while I was doing secondary analysis on obstructed labor, um, Dr. Goldenberg also arranged for me to go and try to learn about um, how obstructed labor results in neurogenital fistula clinically. And so he set me up with a colleague of his, Dr. Hilary Maibea in Eldoret, Kenya. Dr. Maibea is a consultant at Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital, um, and he works full time there. And then in his after hours, he actually um, provides fistula surgery free of care to women who travel to his hospital from all over the region. 
Um, and this is the setting in which he does that free fistula surgery that he rented a house across the street from the hospital and he took this tiny house and basically turned it into a facility where he sees outpatients, provides um, inpatient surgery, fistula repair, and has some words for patients to stay and recover. And I wanted to show this to you because it's really inspired some of my later work that I'll show you later in the presentation, but this is the kitchen of the house. So he really outfitted the kitchen and turned it into a clean and sterile environment where he's providing care. It's not you know, a formal fancy hospital setting. So while I was there um, participating in the care of these women, hearing their stories, um, seeing how their obstructed labor, which is when basically the labor does not progress normally and the fetus becomes impacted in the pelvis um, and the tissues that are between the fetus and the pelvic bones, the blood is not able to perfuse properly to those organs. And so those organs become very damaged. And when the obstruction is eventually um, relieved, as the tissues heal, they form scar tissue and abnormal communications form. Those are called urogenital fistula. And often it leaves women with the inability uh, to control their urine and feces. And it has a, a very significant impact socially, emotionally, and physically on these women. So, you know, seeing these things in person, not just looking at the global network data set, not just evaluating them, you know, from home on the stats program, but actually being there, seeing these women, hearing their stories. Um, it really had a profound impact on me because I realized that each woman was kind of a harbinger or, or a red flag of, of healthcare system failure. And that where each one of these um, women was coming from was a place that was not offering women uh, adequate access to emergency obstetric care. And so I was really inspired by this experience to take um, you know, a bigger picture view. I was more interested in, in the root cause and increasing access to emergency obstetric care as well as the end product, which is preventing and treating your genital fistula. So what do I do? Um, and so this is just to show you this woman again are the, the tip of the iceberg and that behind them, underneath them, is just an entire societal infrastructure that's failing them. Um, and I just felt like that wasn't, that was something that I became very passionate about and interested in. And so as I was saying, what do I do when I'm interested in something? Well, I run straight to Dr. Goldenberg and I go straight to the global network. And so I went to him and said, you know, I'm really interested in, in emergency obstetric care and, and access to care and issues around cesarean birth let's look at what the experiences of the global network. So we looked at the data that again, we had at that time, which was 2010 to 2015, and I am gonna move the chat up here so I can see um, what you guys are saying. I am curious to see what your brief observations are about this slide really quickly. If you wanna just, anybody want, wants to just type in what they are observing or noticing about this, slide. Okay. I'm not seeing um, anything in the chat. So I guess what, <laughs> okay, I'm seeing some, I'm seeing some feedback here, which I'm very grateful. And I think people are, it's interesting. People are kind of like looking at the countries. They're focused on um, the experience of particular countries. And when I look at this, this slide, to me, it really, tells me a tale of two cesarean birth stories. You know, at the top of the slide, we see um, relatively high cesarean birth rates starting off, and then just in five short years, those rates are doubling. So at all of these sites, rates doubled, even just over five years, which is just such a short time frame. Can you imagine any other intervention that's just double, maybe, co you know, trying to treat COVID has, doubled so fast in such a short period of time. But for cesarean birth, a major abdominal surgery, you know, the top half of the chart, we see, you know, rates that have gone from like 16% all the way up to almost 30%. Whereas at the bottom of the screen, we see just a very different experience. You know, some of these sites may have doubled in rates, but they're doubling from, you know, 0.8 to 1.6, and they're still well below the 5% cesarean birth rate. And so I thought this was a very interesting finding. And when I um, went on to look at what some of the literature was that was out there, this is a paper that was published by my mentor at WHO, Anna Pilar Bertrand. And she had a very similar looking chart. She really found from looking at demographic and health surveys that 
um, the experience in non-African, non-Sub-Saharan African regions of the world was that cesarean birth rates, of course, over a longer time period were rising, whereas we're seeing sort of stagnant, stable rates in the Sub-Saharan African setting. So what did they say about it? Well, I don't know if any of you know, but in 1985, um, WHO you know, published about cesarean birth rates, sort of suggesting that across the global, global population based on the literature, somewhere between a 10 and 15% cesarean birth rate was probably appropriate and adequate. And I think in, in reviewing this data and seeing what was happening in so many countries and seeing oops, how far many countries have progressed past you know, a 15% cesarean birth rate, they really changed their focus away from a specific number and more towards really understanding um, and promoting use of cesarean birth for the right reasons at the right time with good technique to women who are in need. So really optimizing the intervention, making sure that it's medically necessary um, and isn't being over or underused. And so in order to dig deeper and provide a richer understanding than one rate or one number can provide, the WHO promoted the use of the Robson classification system. So what they did is a systematic review of all cesarean birth classification systems that were available at that time and decided that the Robson classification system, which had been published in 2001, was really um, the system that was most translatable you know, within an organization. They could use it over time to track their trends across organizations, within countries, um, you know, or globally, across the world. So this classification system takes every single woman and is actually able to mutually exclusively separate each woman into one of 10 different groups, just using basic obstetric variables that most facilities are just part of the obstetric history. So um, any woman admitted to a facility who someone's taking care of, or even if it's in the home setting, they would really know about these women. Is this their first baby or have they, have they had a baby before? You, what's their relative gestational age, term versus preterm? Did they go into labor spontaneously or were they induced or underwent pre-labor cesarean birth? How many fetuses did they have? And what's their history of prior cesarean birth? Um, so this paper by Joshua Vogel, who's also been an amazing mentor to me um, from WHO, shows the application of the Robson classification system to WHO data sets. So WHO did two large surveys. One was conducted in 2004. The other was conducted in 2008. The 2004 data collection was really focused on mode of delivery. The 2008 data collection was focused on near miss or maternal, you know, severe morbidity. And what they wanted to do with the Robson classification system was to see who was contributing to cesarean birth rates on a global level and what was happening with cesarean birth rates between those two time points. So while it looks like a very overwhelming and confusing slide, in blue, we have high, higher human development index countries. Um, in red, moderate, and in green, lower human development index countries. And this top row here just shows all the women who are presenting to labor and delivery. So across the world, of the population who, of women who are presenting for labor and delivery, in all settings, it's largely made up of women who are term, have gone into spontaneous labor, and have a fetus that's head down, so not breech. And the difference between groups one and groups three is that one, it's their first baby, and three, they've had a baby before. So really across the world, when you're in a labor and delivery setting, you're mostly seeing women who are in spontaneous labor, have a term baby, a, um, a well-presenting baby for a vaginal birth, and it may be their first baby or they've had one before. But what's interesting is when we look at the second row, which breaks down the cesarean birth rates in these groups, we see a different picture. Even though groups one and groups three contribute the most amount of women in general, the cesarean birth rates are really coming from pre-labor cesarean sections in nulliparous women, so first baby, and pre-labor cesarean sections in women who've had a baby before, and in the group of people who've had a prior cesarean birth. Um, and that is also the situation in moderate and low human development index countries as well. So the conclusion that WHO came up with from looking at this data was that prior cesarean birth rates, you know, group five is really contributing to cesarean birth rates. It's important to prevent uh, primary cesarean birth. And then of course, 
um, avoidance of medically unnecessary cesarean section, and then case selection for induction of labor. So as usual, what do we do? We look at the global network data. So we added after we saw this um, WHO cesarean statement and their pushing of the Robson classification system, we did add those data collection points to our maternal and newborn health registry to try to track what was happening um, in a more nuanced way with our cesarean birth rates rather than just the trend overall. So what you can see from this slide is since we added the data, I think we added it in 2017 or somewhere around there, we started collecting in around 2018. So in the past few years, we've had about 10,000 cesarean births. And unsurprisingly, as you guys have now learned, only about 500 of those cesarean sections are coming from our clusters and our communities that we track in our African sites. Whereas in our non-African sites, look at this, Guatemala is almost contributing half of all the cesarean births over just that short time frame um, to the overall cesarean birth rate. So if we look at it by African versus non-African sites, we can see that similar to the WHO data in this group one and this group three, the, the greatest number of women that just contribute to labor and delivery in general are the ones experiencing the highest cesarean birth rate. So this really represents primary cesarean birth in sub-Saharan Africa. Whereas in our non-African sites, you know, these are the women that are being induced or undergoing pre-labor cesarean birth, higher rates of induction and pre-labor cesarean birth resulting in cesarean birth in the non-African sites, as well as very high rates of cesarean birth among women who have a prior history of cesarean birth. So, you know, just coming back to this slide, I, I want to switch gears now, um, but I think up to this point, you know, I've shared how I became interested in this by way of obstructed labor and, and urogenital fistula, um, and then really realized that cesarean birth is this very rich area of research, and that to me, there's really this two completely different stories of, of regions in the world where cesarean birth is really increasing and regions of the world where it's really staying stagnant or increasing at very slow rates. You can see this top line here is um, represents Latin America and the Caribbean and in this paper um, they had the highest regional average cesarean birth rate at 40.5 percent and uh, I'm very very fortunate that when I left Columbia and came to the University of Colorado um, and Nanette Santoro hired me here which I'm very grateful for she sort of um, encouraged Stephen Berman and Nancy Krebs to really take me under their wing and include me in their, in their research programs, for which I'm very grateful. And both of them happen to have research projects in Latin America and Guatemala. Um, and so in terms of the uh, Stephen, Steve Berman site, um, he works very closely with Edwin Asturias at the Center for Global Health. And the University of Colorado has set up a public-private partnership with a local agribusiness in southwest Guatemala in a region referred to as the Southwest Trifinio, where they've really set up a healthcare infrastructure there. Um, they have started a clinic. They provide routine care and vaccination, um, general health care, as well as, well as workers' health-specific programs, nutrition-specific programs. And then they run community-based programs as well, which I think is really unique and amazing. They basically provide maternal and child health by having community nurses provide outreach care into the community. So the nurses in our maternal and child health program um, these are, this is our nurse team. The, they provide care through the Madre Sanas program. And in teams of two, they actually go out from the clinics. So the clinic is located here. In teams of two, they actually go out to 12 different communities. And they travel by tuk-tuk. So you can see that these distances are not that far. They go out in the morning, see some patients, and come back um, for lunch, and then go back out again in the afternoon. But they're providing four antepartum, scheduled antepartum visits, and two postpartum visits. And they also provide um, unscheduled visits as well. So if women have complications and need to be followed up, they call them and they go back to their house to visit them. But modeled on the global network, while they see these patients and provide clinical care consistent with um, WHO guidelines, they're actually also collecting quality improvement data on these women. So when they go, they ask them questions, um, collect data about their pregnancy, follow them intrapartum, 
sorry, antepartum, um, and then postpartum to learn about their interpartum experience and track their pregnancy outcomes. And we do this uh, as part of a quality improvement program to see, you know, what are areas of need, how can we develop um, quality improvement programming or prospective research, and what's the association of what we do with pregnancy outcomes and, and our impact that we're having on the community. So I'm sure you guys are not surprised to learn that as soon as I joined the team, I was very interested in what was going on with cesarean birth in this community. So we had a good data set from the two prior years before I joined, and you can see again, such a short, short time frame, 2015 to 2017, vaginal birth rates decreasing, cesarean birth rates increasing. So you might think, okay, well, this program was started in 2011. These are skilled nurses. They're going out, they're providing education, they're providing care. In this community, women uh, traditionally have given birth in the home setting with traditional birth attendants. So you might think, okay, well, one impact that this nursing program might be having is really encouraging people to deliver in the facility setting. So maybe rates of C-section are rising because more people are going to the hospital. So we did look at our data set and found that facility-based births were still relatively consistent around 70% across the time frame, And that despite that, the cesarean birth rate again was still increasing. So maybe it was indication. We took a look at the indications, maybe indication over time was changing, but you can see our numbers are not that big. Um, down here, especially for these indications in the bottom half of the chart, they really bounce around not totally clear whether any particular indication was driving that increase. We did look at bivariate comparisons of uh, the population of women who delivered by vaginal birth as compared to cesarean birth and did find prolonged obstructed labor, malpresentation of the fetus, or a history of prior cesarean birth were contributing factors to cesarean birth. When we looked at our multivariable model, we saw basically the same thing when we um, adjusted for uh, patient characteristics and for time, we found that prolonged obstructed labor, malpresentation, any antepartum complication, and again, history of prior cesarean section were increasing our risk of cesarean birth. So here, this just going back to the global network, I, I wanted to show that, um, you know, I'm very pleased to participate with the global network here at the University of Colorado that's run by Nancy Krebs in collaboration with Dr. Anna Garces from Guatemala. When we look at that site's data, again, we see that the highest proportion of women undergoing cesarean birth come from the group with a history of previous cesarean birth. So now from our data set and from their data set, we're seeing high rates of cesarean birth um, among women with a history of prior cesarean birth. So um, I know WHO sort of said, you know, we got to focus on preventing primary cesarean birth. That's been an initiative here in the United States. But I was very curious, you know, what were we doing for women with a history of prior cesarean birth in our Madre Sanas program? And what we were doing was just recommending that they go to the hospital for delivery. But when I looked at some of our historical data, I found that I think two thirds of women were actually um, attempting trial of labor after cesarean in the home setting. And so we didn't really want to implement any educational program or any decision making tool or education around mode of delivery without really understanding where women stood on the issue. Were they interested in facility based birth? Were they interested in trial of labor after cesarean or elective repeat? Do they understand the risks and benefits to both? Um, delivery methods and were they having, what were their, what was their attitudes and beliefs towards mode of delivery? And we also certainly didn't want to recommend blanket statement they go to the hospital if they really desired trial of labor after cesarean and, and for whatever reason that might not be something the hospital offers. So we wanted to know both from the provider perspective and the patient perspective, what were the feelings around mode of delivery among women with a history of prior cesarean birth, and is there anything that we can do there to improve education within our Madre Sanas program? So I'm very grateful to Nanette Santoro and Janelle Sheeter and the Department of OBGYN for supporting um, our team to go down uh, using academic enrichment fund money to uh, the local hospital, the Coatepeque Hospital, which is the closest hospital to our Southwest Trifinio site, to really get the provider perspective on mode of delivery. I'm grateful to Katie Feller, who's one of the OBGYN residents for joining me, as well as Angela Marchin, who's one of the Global Health Fellows. And I'm forever indebted to Andrea Jimenez-Zambrano, Zambrano, is the Director of Qualitative Research for the Center of Global Health, who has 
collaborated with me from day one that I joined University of Colorado. She's involved. Um, we work on every one of my projects together and uh, she really guided us on this project and I'm very grateful to her. So we went down in February. We interviewed 10 providers. We have just um, transcribed and translated our data. So I cannot speak to our results from a, a position of confidence, but um, from, I guess, a preliminary data standpoint, my sense of what the doctors were saying was that I, I think every single one of them um, felt that vaginal birth after C-section was the preferred mode of delivery just in terms of maternal and child health but that there were barriers to trial of labor after C-section in the hospital setting, which just included um, the ability to monitor these women appropriately, the ability to counsel them. They do not have forceps and vacuum capacity at this facility. They haven't done any operative vaginal delivery in the past 10 years. And they also mentioned liability and also patients um, really pushing for elective repeat cesarean birth as opposed to um, trial labor after cesarean. So when we spoke to women, and I was not present for all of the interviews, um, but the ones that I did observe, and Andrea, you feel very comfortable. I know you're on this call with, um, you know, disagreeing with me or, or if maybe our prelim data, your opinion of our prelim data is different, but I sort of felt like the women coming from this community, having a history of um, traditional birth attendance of home-based birth, even though they had had a history now of prior cesarean birth, their ideal birth, if you ask them, you know, with your next pregnancy, what, really what would be your ideal delivery story? They really wanted to be in the home setting with a traditional birth attendant, but above all else, they cared most about their fetal outcomes or their infant outcomes. And so many of them said, you know, it was terrible. The cesarean birth that I had was terrifying, um, but if someone told me it was safest for my baby to be in a facility setting and it was safest for the baby to undergo cesarean birth, then that would be my choice. So we'll see what the final data shows, but um, uh, we do intend to use the Robson classification for our Madre Sanas data to see if we can get a little bit more detail on what's going on in our community. Um, and then I'm very grateful to Anna Garces and Lester Figueroa and Nancy Krebs um, for agreeing to collaborate with us to try to really understand what's going on in Guatemala, not only in our community, but in other communities related to cesarean birth rates. When we were down at the site, the cesarean birth rate in February or in January was 70%. So I think there's a lot of interest in, in what's going on with cesarean birth rates there. And, and um, we are planning some prospective research to try to understand drivers of high cesarean birth rates and what interventions we might be able to do. Um, to optimize use of cesarean birth in these settings. So I got to bring you back to this slide. I know you've seen it a million times. Um, this is updated data from the global network. So you see now that we've come out to 2018. Um, and yet again, we see that we have not really put a dent in cesarean birth rates in sub-Saharan African setting. Um, I see, you know, Pakistan is maybe standing out more somewhere in the middle. And then again, we're seeing rates now over 35% at some of our sites. And it's kind of interesting to note that this is our Indian site, one of our Indian sites. Um, and Guatemala is not leading the charge on cesarean birth rates. Um, so this kind of makes me wonder if we had Dr. Bertrand do her demographic and health survey um, analysis again, where, where would other regions of the world stand in terms of their cesarean birth rate? Would Latin America still be leading the charge or would maybe Southeast Asia uh, be showing us higher rates? But so we've sort of talked about what maybe what's going on in high income setting, I mean, in um, high cesarean birth rate settings. I'm also very interested in, in, in a better, gaining a better understanding of what's going on in the Sub-Saharan African setting. So again, I am just incredibly grateful to be able to collaborate with Dr. Megs Muldrew. She is based here in Denver. She's a dermatologist. She's actually my dermatologist. So if you're looking for a dermatologist, look her up. She's great. She grew up in Ethiopia and um, obviously left and is set up here now, but she has gone back. And I think to her, what was most upsetting when she went back is that she really felt like in the 40 years she'd been gone, the impact or the change of, of maternal outcomes, maternal pregnancy outcomes, there had been no significant change. And, um, you know, she joked with me when we were there together, she wishes she had been an OBGYN, but she, she's really committed herself. She's passionate about improving maternal health care in, in, in rural Southwest Ethiopia, in the Benchmaji zone where she grew up. Um, and she has partnered with the referral facility there, Mizan Tepe University Teaching Hospital, to mentor and provide outreach to 
communities that are as far as six and eight hours away by car um, to try and improve referral and maternal health in those regions by building maternal waiting homes out in these locations, trying to increase the quality of care in the clinic settings. She actually provides training on helping babies breathe and helping mothers survive. She's now focused and been bringing um, engineers out to these sites to even help with just getting water to facilities. So she does amazing work and I'm very grateful to be able to collaborate with her and through her was introduced to Dr. Tekla Maryam Yerambab, who is a PH candidate in reproductive health and also the chief executive director of the referral facility. And together we really want to understand what's going on um, with maternal health in general, but of, of course also cesarean birth, both at the facility and out in the, in the more rural areas. Um, so this is one of the labor rooms and a picture of the NICU at the facility. This past fall, um, we're grateful to the Doris Duke Foundation for funding us to um, collect some basic epidemiologic preliminary data um, on a convenient sample of women, just observational data of women presenting to Mazan Tepe University Teaching Hospital uh, to labor and delivery who were admitted for labor and delivery at over 28 weeks gestational age. So once we collected data on a thousand women, um, we wanted to take a look at mode of delivery. So for of the women that we had data available on, we found that about a fourth of them are undergoing cesarean birth and three fourths of them are undergoing vaginal birth. In the setting of cesarean birth, we have most of it occurring in, in during the course of labor or during intrapartum uh, with only a minority, about 10%, um, undergoing elective cesarean birth before the onset of labor or as a pre-labor cesarean birth. In terms of vaginal birth, I was actually quite pleased, even though these rates are very low, to see that there is forceps assistive vaginal birth and vacuum assisted vaginal birth, just given the experience in Guatemala, um, that they are skilled and able to provide that service. Um, but that being said, many of the women are just uh, undergoing uh, normal spontaneous vaginal birth. So, uh, I know you guys are probably curious about the, the women with a history of prior cesarean birth. Um, of women with prior cesarean birth, we can see that about two thirds of them underwent repeat cesarean birth. Um, but that we do have some women, even women with a prior history of two prior cesarean births who are able to achieve successful vaginal birth after cesarean. So they tried trial of labor after cesarean section um, and were able to deliver vaginally. So that, that is an option for women at this facility. When we look at indication for cesarean birth, I know this is a busy slide. I didn't wanna like come up with every indication and have people checking off. And I just asked that we look at just, was it a fetal indication? Was it a maternal indication? Was it a dysfunctional labor problem? What was the story? And I think the message from this slide is really that um, we de collected our data based on chart review and maternal interview. And if you look at cesarean sections where no indication was noted or it was just an entirely elective, we couldn't find any other reason they underwent cesarean birth, these numbers are very low. And so to me, that shows that at MTUTH, at least in terms of what they're writing down in the chart or what the patient is saying, they're really trying to uphold um, the WHO value of, of making sure that cesarean birth is medically necessary and indicated. So of course we can't do anything without the Robson classification system and really trying to dig into our uh, population that we collected data on and understand who's contributing to cesarean birth in that setting. So again, this looks very much like the first row of the WHO data that we saw. Um, most of the women who are coming in in labor are these kind of uncomplicated, spontaneous term labors, women who've never had a baby before, women who've had a baby before. Um, who are contributing to the largest population of people presenting to the facility. Very low numbers here in group two and four of women who are being induced. This is women with a history of prior cesarean birth. So four points that, you know, under 5% of the population has a history of cesarean birth. Six, seven, and nine are babies that are not head down. So breach and transverse. Group eight here is twins. So about a 5% twin rate as well. And then a preterm birth rate of 8.8%, .8%, which is, actually pretty good. So now the money is here in B, which shows us what are the cesarean birth rates within those subgroups. So again, a groups one and three that contribute the most people to the laboring population, you can see they are really the lowest rates that we see overall. So relatively low rates 
among those large subgroups, slightly higher rates among women who are induced. Among women, again, with a history of prior cesarean birth, two thirds of them delivering by elective repeat cesarean birth, one third by vaginal birth after C-section. These malpresenting babies, so breech and transverse babies, you know, it was kind of interesting to see that among multiparous women, women who've had a baby before, that some of them are actually, well, two thirds of them are having breech vaginal birth. The twins, 40% of them delivered by C-section, so a large proportion of them delivering vaginally, and then among the preterm births, again, a good, nice, low rate. So if you're combining sort of that, in, that indication slide, um, and then you're combining this slide, again, you know, you don't really know without observation and, and knowing what the decision-making process was about a C-section, but to me that paints a picture of, of appropriate use of cesarean birth. Here um, we looked at a multivariable model. We collected a number of variables um, on the women, their antepartum situation, their uh, sociodemographic characteristics, their intrapartum experience, their postpartum outcomes. And um, risk factors that were significant in the multivariable model were history of prior cesarean birth, increase your risk of C-section, transferred from another place in labor, increase risk of C-section, right? So somebody started laboring somewhere else, it didn't go that great, they had to be transferred to the referral facility. So not surprising, those people are higher risk of cesarean birth. A longer labor, so something starts to become dysfunctional over the course of labor, higher risk of cesarean birth. Bigger baby, I mean, 2,500 grams, not that big, but bigger baby in a population where um, there may be some nutritional issues, greater risk of cesarean birth. And then of course, increased cervical dilation. So that just means they were further on in their labor when they were admitted to the hospital, reduced risk of cesarean birth. So again, consistent with this story that these seem to be appropriate indications for cesarean birth. Now the bottom half of the chart here, I took women who um, experienced cesarean birth and I made cesarean birth the independent variable adjusted for all of the variables that were significant in the multivariable model and then did independent logistic regressions of all of the outcomes, maternal and neonatal outcomes that had been significant in bivariate comparisons that compared mode of delivery. So matern women had done you know, better or worse based on whether they had a vaginal birth or a C-section. So I wanted to look at each one of those outcomes individually and try to figure out what role cesarean birth contributed to that adverse outcome. And you can see that the only outcome that was significant was needing postpartum antibiotics. And it's a well-known fact that cesarean birth increases your risk of endometritis. So again, just a final um, clapping of hands to MTUTH to say that, you know, we're not, we're seeing appropriate use of cesarean section and it's not associated with um, neonatal demise in the hospital setting. It's not associated with a reduced risk of fetal uh, live birth. Um, you know, it's not associated with reduced APGRs or more sick mothers or mothers needing a blood transfusion. So to me, I'm pleased with the situation at MTUTH in terms of cesarean birth management. But some of you might be thinking like, okay, you started off by showing us this, um, this flow diagram where the cesarean birth rate was 23.4%. And I'm just like not understanding how that jives with an under 5% cesarean birth rate. Well, 23.4%, this was over a couple of months we collected this data, maybe two or four months. I hope you guys can't hear my children screaming the way that I can hear them. Um, over the course of the year, you may only get 1,000 women or 1,500 women who undergo cesarean birth, but the catchment area for this hospital is 2.5 million women. And if you think about like the historically recommended 10 to 15% cesarean birth rate, even if you went with 5% of 2.5 million, it's way more than 1,000. So what is going on? Well, some of you may be familiar with the three delays model. This is a model published 25 years ago about um, maternal mortality and access to emergency obstetric care in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the author suggested that socioeconomic, cultural, um, access to facilities, quality of care were the issues that were largely contributing to delays in women deciding to seek care, identifying and reaching a health facility, and receiving adequate and appropriate treatment. So when I was there last year um, in 2019, I gave a little lecture and um, you can see there were very few people that attended, but um, I, I was obviously interested in, in fistula. I was interested in access to cesarean birth. I was interested in how they felt. These are all providers, um, medical staff meeting how they, what they felt about their cesarean birth rate, whether or not it had increased. And you can see that there's sort of, oops, a variable opinion 
based on who was attending the meeting, but one thing that they 100% agreed on was that the three delays is still relevant in their community. 25 years after it's published, a quarter of a century, nothing has, even though we've known what the barriers are to care, not much has been done to improve outcomes. So from a provider perspective, they still felt this model was relevant. And then from a patient perspective, um, some of the preliminary re data that we have about delays in use, utilization of facility-based care comes from um, Teclamarium. He went out into these communities that you can see are very geographically isolated. Um, Ethiopia is a very mountainous country. And talked to them about delays in seeking care. And um, you know they included poor road conditions, rainy season, finances, transferability, and it was really just embodied by this three delays model that 76.3% of the women that he interviewed were delayed in receiving their care and 69.4 of them felt that they had no access to a health facility. The average time to reach a facility for those who were trying to reach a facility was five hours. Um, and these are, these are all pictures that I took when I was there. You can see that these are just massively vast distances with very mountainous terrain. Um, and that this was taken at one of the facilities um, in the Sorma region that was about six or seven hours by car away from Mazanaman where MTOTH is. And um, you know, many of these women are, are traveling by stretcher, few by car and about 50% are traveling by foot. So to me also from the patient perspective, the three delays are still um, contribute to poor access to care. So uh, I think Tecla Merriam and, and Dr. Muldrew and myself are very passionate about this lack of access to care and what we can do to improve it. And so we um, have started exploring innovative ideas where we are interested in bringing cesarean birth to women instead of focusing on bringing women to care. So kind of thinking outside the box in terms of the traditional healthcare infrastructure in these geographically isolated and underserved regions, how can we improve access to care. So we did submit a grant to NICHD to explore the appropriateness and acceptability and feasibility of this concept to people out in these regions. Um, and I think, you know, as soon as I put this picture up, everyone's mind is just buzzing with like all the things that you would need to consider um, if you were actually going to try to deliver people in these settings. And one of those things might be, well, who's going to do cesarean birth? You know, often uh, many of you know that there is a shortage of surgical providers in sub-Saharan Africa. Well, it turns out that Ethiopia, Ethiopia happens to be one of the leaders in training non-physician surgeons. So they started a program in 2009 where they trained a cadre of providers called integrated emergency surgical officers to perform emergency surgery and obstetric care. And there is a paper that looked at the experience of eight hospitals between 2012 and 2014, and about 4,000 surgeries had been performed, and 94% of the surgeries in those facilities were performed by the IESOs. Um, and I, I like, I only cut half the um, figure here to show you guys, but what, what was also very interesting to me, they're providing obstetric care, 63% of their um, surgeries are cesarean birth, so they're getting a lot of experience in providing cesarean birth, and this did increase the cesarean birth rate in these situations to 13%, but what I really find um, interesting and amazing and, and helpful is that these providers are also providing manual vacuum aspiration. Um, so that's where you can remove some retained products of conception from a uterus. If, if, if they're incompletely empty, you may need to do a procedure like an MVA or an evacuation and curatage um, to prevent maternal hemorrhage and infection. And also this instrumental delivery. So they're trained in instrumental delivery, four steps in vacuum. And we did see that, um, I did an analysis on the on the operative vaginal births at MTUTH, and most of them are performed by the IESO that is at MTUTH. So our concept is, is really trying to figure out would something like a mobile cesarean birth unit um, increase ask, access for women in geographically isolated and under, underserved communities um, by providing care in sort of a mobile setting um, with a mid-level provider. And then again, I sort of mentioned to you guys at the beginning that I was inspired by Dr. Maibea 
uh, like he didn't let, you know, um, the lack of a facility or the inability to pay for patient care to stand in his way of serving those fistula patients. He just turned a house into an operating room. And so I think, you know, there are companies now that produce these mobile units. Um, they've been used in the United States. They've been used in low and middle income country settings. I know that Médecins Sans Frontières is um, providing, in 2017, they provided 35,000 cesarean births in um, war settings um, to women in need. So I think this is a, is a potentially fundable idea. Um, I'm very pleased to say that we were scored on our grant and we're currently, I'm, I'm very grateful um, to Dr. Ephraim at MTUTH for trying to collect some preliminary data on the acceptability, appropriateness and feasibility from women and from providers on this concept um, that maybe next year Gates or um, NICHD will fund us to do this work. And that next time I talk, I'll be able to pre present some of that data to you guys. So um, we're basically done here. I just can't end the presentation without showing you the slide one more time. Um, and sort of feeling like there's a supply and demand issue with cesarean birth and um, that there is an opportunity here and that my research really focuses on optimizing use of this very resource intensive surgery. And in these settings where it's potentially being overused, how do we optimize that use and make sure that every C-section that's happening is medically necessary? We're not causing undue harm to women and babies, that it's performed at the right time for the right reasons with good technique. And um, you know, it's not only about access and optimization, it's also about quality. Um, I did see in some of the fistula literature that as cesarean birth does become more accessible, more of the, your, of the fistulas that are occurring um, are occurring from poorly performed cesarean birth. So then again, also as we're, as we're providing, trying to increase access to cesarean birth here, how can we concurrently really focus on prevention of primary cesarean birth, um, optimal use and highest quality of care? So with that, I'm just very grateful to Nanette Santoro and my mentor, Janelle Sheeter, within the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology for supporting me in this work since um, I joined University of Colorado. I'm grateful to NICHD for allowing me to be an investigator within the global network, both um, under Dr. Goldenberg and under Dr. Krebs, and allowed me to collaborate with amazing people like Anna Garces and Lester Figueroa, and to support me on the K-12 that I'm currently funded on. Um, um, as always, indebted to the Center for Global Health, Dr. Berman, Dr. Asturias, and soon to be Dr. Andrea jimenez Sembrano for um, supporting me in the work that I do. And then I'm very pleased to uh, work with Dr. Muldrew and Tekla Maram Nirenbab. I'm just super excited about where our collaboration will take us um, and to the Doris Duke Foundation for supporting some of this preliminary work. So without further ado, I think that about sums it up for me. Um, and I don't know if, um, Christina, you wanna, um, if we wanna do questions by chat or if we want to, uh, allow people to come off mute and share their thoughts. I would be um, very interested in responding to any questions. Thank you. Um, Christina thinks that maybe by chat is better. So um, there are a lot of questions in the chat. All right, so let me scroll back up. And look at all these amazing things that I, I neglected while I was focused on my talk. A lot of people uh, commenting on the, um, on the slide. Um, did you look at the type of inf incision since it affects success of VBACs? Um, we did not, I'm assuming that we're talking about um, the only place that where we collected sort of general baseline preliminary data was on in at MTUTH. And we did not go into the operating room and collect any data on the actual cesarean birth itself. We did not observe the C-section or, or collect data on type of incision. Um, but Sarah Freeman is, is raising a flag that um, not everybody is appropriate for vaginal or trial of labor after C-section and, and hopefully successfully back. And um, I did ask, 
my collaborators there, when I saw the VBAC rates were higher than a lot of settings, you know, what is the process that you guys use? What is your intrapartum management? And they do have very specific checklists, as they do in Guatemala, of who is appropriate for a trial of labor after cesarean. Um, in the Ethiopian setting, they have them on one-to-one -one observation. Um, so somebody else just mentioned that they were waiting hours watching a fetal tracing, waiting for somebody to get a C-section. And, um, and I think, you know, in the, in the setting of uh, a prior cesarean birth, close management of the fetus and the mom um, are very important. So you have to make sure that, um, yes, you've properly counseled people and that uh, if they have a history of classical cesarean birth, they were not candidates for trial labor in Ethiopia or in Guatemala, um, from my experience. What's the fistula rate in Guatemala prior to the increase in C-section? Good question. Um, Guatemala has extremely low rates of fistula. Uh, fistula rates are, I think, probably because a lot of um, women are hard to find and don't always present to care. Um, you know, it's like a 0.05% prevalence or something in, in the entire world if you look at WHO data. And when I first joined the Global Network, I did add questions about fistula and we did collect data on fistula for about six months to a year. And we basically got nobody with fistula in any of our settings. But um, from the literature that I, I am not up to date on the fistula literature, but from what I remember when I was really focused on that at the beginning of my career, Latin America basically did not experience much fistula. Um, and I think that's a great question and a good area for further research. Oh, and I see Anna Garces actually, um, who's based in Guatemala, responded very low. Does IVF play a role in the increase in cesarean um, section of birth rates in Sub-Saharan Africa? Um, I recently looked at a WHO data set and looked at risk factors that were associated with complications of cesarean birth and, um, and suggested that an increased twinning rate from assisted reproductive technologies may be associated with increased risk of adverse outcomes following cesarean birth. Um, and co-authors were not comfortable with um, that assertion and we couldn't find good data to support it. So I guess I, I would hypothesize that um, from both a, a concern for a precious baby, somebody who's tried really hard to get pregnant, and um, from a, um, a, a multiple gestation standpoint that there may be some role in um, assisted reproductive technologies. And I think that's a great area for further research um, we are starting to look at indication for cesarean birth in the global network, and we did add a number of indications, but I don't think we're capturing that particular aspect, so that might be something. Anna Garces is basically in charge of, of that and is on this call, so I think that could be something we could um, talk about in the future. How many C-section deliveries can you accommodate in the mobile clinic for day? Is that sufficient to where you will need to roll this out? So part of the, this basically this first grant is a fully it's a pre-implementation grant so what we're proposing to do is to go there and just mostly conduct qualitative research go out to the communities we would serve find out what barriers there are to cesarean birth in addition to the th three delays um, and then is this is this a viable solution to those barriers or does it need to be code you know iterated upon. So we're not suggesting that this is the solution, um, but what we are doing is putting a prototype out there, a concept for people to be able to really mull over and address some of these questions. And so in our first aim, we're just talking to people like, why don't you go to the facility? What are barriers to going to the facility? Um, um, what what would make you get, sorry just what are the basic issues getting to cesarean birth and then what do you think of this idea and how can we redesign it into something that makes more sense is it should it be mobile should it be fixed is it big enough do people labor somewhere else what do they do postpartum who decides when it's time to go to a c-section will people still be at home how will we get water how will we get electricity at what point will we add bread products so a lot of those issues will come in the second aim which is really focused on um, working through actual business models, using human-centered design to stand in the spot where it would be and start to think through like, okay, well, at this site, we just don't have water. So do we need a rain collection system here? Like, what about this particular idea? How will it work in this particular setting? And how do we need to address some of those logistical issues? So 
All of those questions I'm hopeful will come out and I'm ha very happy to receive emails after this about things that we're not considering that people have encountered in their own experience or what this talk makes them think about that you think we should consider if we're funded to go forward with that research. Um, what has been the impact of the maternal mortality ratio in those settings of cesarean birth? Well, I think we showed, um, we did not, we've, we did not, I don't think we included birth outcomes in our recent cesarean birth evaluation. I see Dr. Goldenberg is on there. We just submitted a paper to reproductive health where I showed you guys the Robson classification system. And I'm not sure if we looked at birth outcomes associated with the rise in C-section. Um, I know that we have looked at operative vaginal delivery related to C-section in the global network, and we have noticed a decline in operative vaginal delivery as we've noted an increase in cesarean section, but I have to just look really quickly at that paper and remind myself um, of whether or not we looked at outcomes. Dr. Goldenberg, can you shake your head yes or no if we looked at outcomes? Do you remember? He doesn't remember either. So um, that question came from Beth Fisher, and I'm just going to look at that paper and um, get back to you on that. But um, I'm not sure what we covered in that paper and what the goal was regarding cesarean birth, but certainly looking at outcomes related to cesarean birth in the global network is really important, just like we did with um, obstructive labor. Sorry, we did a, a paper in 2016 where we looked at mode of delivery and we did find that cesarean birth was associated with more interventions and in a lot of settings, more adverse outcomes, um, including maternal death. But in the higher income settings, we did see um, improved neonatal outcomes and a reduction in maternal hemorrhage. So that's sort of, if you look up my name in our paper from 2016, that should have some cesarean birth outcomes. Um, and I just don't know if our recent evaluation had outcomes as well. Okay. Um, <laughs> So the dermatologist who is um, in Denver who's involved and would love you to become involved with her organization and support her organization, the organization is called Village Health Partnership. The woman's name is Margaret Muldrew, M-U-L-D-R-O-W. Um, she goes by Migs, and she may actually even be on this call. So I encourage you to reach out and collaborate with her as well. How many surgical providers would you have to train in this region to be able to staff the multiple units? Excellent question. So we, um, in our trip in 2019 in April, went out and started to, we went to visit these communities. As I mentioned, Dr. Muldrow is really focused on improving care in these settings. So every day, it was like 12 hours in the car, six hours out to one community and six hours back just to check in, see had they built their maternal waiting home, had they built their pit latrine, what was going on with their water situation, collect data on how many births that they had had. And there are a number of primary facilities. Ethiopia does have a strategic plan for ramping up their healthcare system. If you look online, you can find it and it includes things like um, training these physician extenders like the IESOs. So there is an infrastructure, there is a beautiful hospital, I think it's in Bachuma that we went to visit. There is no water, there is no water. So there is no cesarean birth happening. They can't clean the OR, they can't clean their hands, they have no access to water. So there are a number of facilities where an operating room exists and an ISO has been sitting there at that site for four years, not providing cesarean birth. So when I first talked to Dr. Muldrow about this idea, she was like, no, we don't need this. We have infrastructure, we have people trained, you know, it's all happening, but I mean, it's all there, it's just not, they're not providing care. And so something that was very interesting was sort of coming around to the concept that, well, if the hospital's not working and the hospital needs a certain amount of water and the well hasn't been built, you know, might this mobile facility just work for a small period of time? And you just start providing C-section with that IESO that's already there, let him, you know, get some cesarean, figure out the amount of water that it takes to run that just small unit, use the facilities for, you know, regular labor and delivery if you can, and, um, and then you don't have to train an additional provider. So I think that's a good question. Um, I don't know what, usually they do have calculations about like per population, how much basic obstetric care do you need? How much emergency obstetric care do you need? And I think it's like, um, you know, for every 500,000, you need an obstetric care unit or something like that. So that would mean like, you know, five, five IESOs that may already exist. Um, so good question. I think something that uh, we would need to explore as we, you know, we're interviewing people um, out in these communities, but we're also intending to 
interview both providers and then also administrators at the zonal level um, to try and build you know governmental collaborations as we roll this out it would be really nice not to roll it out and pay for it with a grant and then the grant is done and the whole thing's done and then no one's using it anymore so i think um trying to build collaborations from the beginning getting um, buy-in and support and and we'll be really leaning on Ted for that as he has a lot of relationships with people in the ministry of health <laughs> i see people are excited dr goldenberg is on the phone um, it's one, one question from my dad, and if it's hard, I'm, I'm not going to answer it. Um, VBAC in some of those slides occurred in about one third of those women with prior cesarean births. So what percentage was that of those deemed eligible? Excellent question. How successful in, in these areas was VBAC in those that are deemed um, eligible? So I think it's a really good question. So you can never, you can't, you in my opinion, you can't force anyone to um, have a VBAC. VBAC is associated with, as I think Sarah pointed out, in worst case scenarios, catastrophic maternal um, and perinatal outcomes. So if a uterus ruptures, a woman could die, a baby could die. And so um, even among people who are eligible, they may not choose to have a BBAC. And I think, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very good question because it's actually a question that I'm currently writing a grant about and wanting to explore because I felt like a VBAC rate of one third at MTUTH based on our global network data was very impressive. And the grant that I'm writing is to go and observe the counseling that's happening at the MTUTH, try to understand the context um, you know, both the labor management, the protocols that are in place on labor and delivery, the culture of the people who work on labor and delivery towards VBAC, the physical setting. My, my actual hypothesis is MTUTH has one OR. And because it only has one OR for everything, I think they're very, very selective about their cesarean births because they're taking up the one space where a trauma may come in or whatever other surgeries need to happen. And so I think it, the whole context, the, the culture, the selection of the patients for VBAC is, is very good there with, um, so I think their, their rates are higher there. Whereas in Guatemala, we did not see a lot of VBAC. We did see that they had an OR specifically for labor and delivery. And so I think because of a lot of contextual factors there, and for a lot of the a patient driven elective repeat cesarean birth rate, um, you know, in, in some ways it was just easier to do a cesarean birth than to do a trial of labor. So it is a good question of all people who are eligible. I think it's sort of like a, a process measure. How well are you counseling people um, how, who, who opt for VBAC? What are their outcomes? I will say I did do an analysis of um, outcomes of VBAC at MTUTH compared to vaginal birth and cesarean section and outcomes were not worse after VBAC, which made me just feel like they're really appropriately selecting patients um, and they're having good outcomes. So hopefully that answered your question. And um, I think the answer is really, it's a great area for future research and I'm looking forward to um, looking into it. So I think that may be a lot of the questions. Did you say the name of the, or okay, somebody already answered that. So I think that may be um, all the questions that I saw. Please retype in a question if you, Still have it. I think we're past time. Um, so thanks for tuning in and feel free to reach out to me by email if I can help you. I will just type my email in so you have it if you would like to follow up with me.